One of the most important questions any human being can be asked is, number one, who is your God? Best brains of the human race would never come up with the definition of who God really is. It doesn't say that God has love. In fact, I would go as far as say God has, it doesn't have any love. Um, God is love. Boy's coming home, he hates himself. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And, and, and the father goes into that, into that darkness and says, right there, I love you. How can we possibly not accept this, this love which is a scene that the prodigal son comes home and in coming home, he'd made up the little speech in his mind. Um, he had not repented in the far country. Uh, actually, he was coming home with a business deal that he would live at arm's length from his father. And he was saying, make me as one of your hired servants. A hired servant in the New Testament was not someone who lived on property. It was a temporary worker. It was your craftsman that um, was available if you needed him. And they usually would be uh, selected at five in the morning down in the marketplace and they worked for the day or the week or whatever. And the son came home for a square meal. He said, I'm starving to death. My father gives good meals, pays good wages, and I'll go and if he has the mercy in him to let me be as a hired servant. So it was a business deal and there, there was that word in it, make me as one of your hired servants. When he came home, his father, it was, it was a, a, a love ambush because here comes the boy and he's a great way off yet, only a silhouette on the horizon. And, and as he is coming um, and he's rehearsing this business deal speech, suddenly through the bushes there emerges this volcano of love that ambushes him, hugs him, kisses him. And, and in, in the, you wonder how he could, but he begins his, his little speech in the middle of all of that. Uh, he only got as far as saying, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and the father interrupted him. And he never did get to say. And it's obvious that he yielded to that. There's no other, no, no other word from the, this younger son after that. He all, he, he's pictured, he receives the robe, he receives, because you, what can you say to love that, that comes w with such a uh, heart application? He comes to the depth of me. The boy's coming home, he hates himself. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Uh, and, and the father, goes into that, into that darkness, and says, right there, I love you. And you're, you're released from your past. You're my son, that's dead. You're now alive again. And, and, and so thereafter, he receives in the, the robe, he receives the shoes, he receives the ring, he receives the feast, and so on. And, and, but the amazing thing is that the elder brother, who had been at home the whole time, had never seen his father's love. He'd been across the table, they'd had breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, but he'd never seen who his father really was. And when he comes home, he, he shows his colors that he thinks the same way as the Pharisees thought, and of course that's part of the story. Jesus has done full circle. The Pharisees are asking, why do you sit with tax collectors and sinners? And, and now at the end of his three stories is really a fourth story. And, and he brings out the elder brother as the very mind of the Pharisee. And, and when the elder brother confronts this love in, in terms of the son, that he, the, the elder brother found his worth his own, shall I say, wretched worth was in, I'm better than him. 
And, and therefore, my bliss, my reward for being better must include his punishment. And so because I'm the better son, I would never do what he has done. I'd never go where he would go. I'm the better son. Therefore, my reward is not only my reward, it must include his punishment so that I can gloat and say I'm not as him. I'm rewarded, he's punished. That's, that was my idea uh, of, of complete, uh, the, the completion of reward. You, you could say that the elder brother said, I will never be happy in heaven until I see him in hell. And, and when he comes home and sees that this one that he despised and said, I'm so much better, he, he sees him sitting at the party and his father throwing the party because the father is so beside himself for joy that this son is home and, and he wouldn't go in, which again was a grave, grave social no-no. Um, but the father came out, which the second time that day, he had gone out to his returning son and had shamed himself and, and in shaming himself, taken the shame of his returning son. Now, the second time that day, he goes out and for what that elder son had done saying no i will not come in in that society he could not shame his father more and yet now the father instead of being enraged he comes out which was shaming himself again in the eyes of the village and the word he uses is he entreated him he begged him he, he, he let love reach out to him and saying, you too are loved. In fact, when he addressed the elder son, he used a, a different word for son. All the way through the parable, the word son is used. But this time it's a different word. It's, oh, my dear son, my, 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 the son of my love. It's the same word that Mary, the Virgin Mary, used when Jesus was lost and in the temple at 12, and when they find him, she said, son, and it's that same word, my dear son. And it's as if the father now is using a greater endearment term for this rebellious son who has now publicly, right in his own courtyard, shamed him. And he comes and entreats him and says, my dear, dear son, all that I have is yours. And, and you are ever with me. And yet there's no record that that son responded. What I realize, and I, I think I said it right at the beginning, you have two views of God. One, one of the most important questions any human being can be asked is, number one, who is your God? Describe to me your God. And out of that, then, who am I? I can only know myself in the light of who I know God to be. And we, we would never, never, the best brains of the human race would never come up with, with the definition of who God really is. It took God to come from God and, and take to himself our humanity and say, he who has seen me has seen the Father, that he is the exegesis, the explanation of God. Only God could tell us who God is, that he is love. Your passion. He reveals himself in terms of what the Bible would call covenant love, which is love that gives itself away. It is um, covenant love is the gifting of my very personhood to another. It's not stuff. I don't give you things. I give myself. And it means that I am bound with you for life or for death. It means that I am one with you. We share history, even though it kills me to do it. It's covenant love. I give myself. That's God, um, the incredible God. The, and, and John summed that up in his epistle by saying, God is love, which I, I never 
um, tire of saying it doesn't say that God has love. In fact, I would go as far as say God has, it doesn't have any love. Um, God is love, vast difference. If I had a glass of water, that glass of water could diminish as I use it. But to, to say, not that I have a glass of water, but I am water, oh, what a difference. And, and, and God doesn't have love. Well, that would mean he could heat and cool and on and off, and sometimes he's in a bad mood and so on. But th this is God is love. He can be no other. This is his essence, his very being. So it's the very being of God to give himself away to us, to sit where we sit, to take us. It doesn't matter who we are, where we've been, and say, I love you, and I give myself to you. I share your history that you now might be included in mine and come and sit with me as my son, my daughter. That, that, that's God, uh, and, and that's the word covenant. That, that's who God is, covenant love. Well, the Pharisee and shall I say, all the way through history. I'll go as far as to say it's the satanic counterfeit. And if it's a counterfeit, it has to be found among those who would speak of religion and speak of salvation and speak of God, but it's the counterfeit. And they counterfeited the word. You know, Satan is called by Jesus the liar. And the, the greatest lie that he told from the beginning is, who is God? And the answer that comes via Satan is a twisted, distorted, ugly picture of God. Uh, and that picture is of a judge. God is love, who gives himself away to us, even when we've crossed the line into death and every form of sin, abomination comes and sits with us. That's who God is. The twist on that, the ugly twist, is that God is the judge who views you remotely as you're over there in death and, and, and your sin and abomination and says, you are wrong, I condemn you and I damn you. That, that's the distortion. He's not. Nowhere in the scripture does it say God is the judge. He's love which means that when he does judge, it's love judging, which is a very different picture. When I look into the face of my judge, he's the one who died for me, the one who came and sat with me to take me where he is. Very different picture. But Satan created religion, and religion pictures him as a judge and only a judge. And the word covenant slides out of the picture and is replaced by the word contract. And instead of a covenant God, it becomes the contract to God. And a contract, well, there's no love in it. A contract is a document of self-preservation. Um, if, if I contract a plumber or an electrician or whatever, um, it's to make sure I get what's coming to me and he gets what's coming to him. We don't trust each other, so we make a contract. And if you do this, then I will do that. But if you don't do that, then I'll sue you. And, and, and if you do that and I don't follow through, then you sue me and so on. We've, we've got this contract. It, it's, uh, you could say that covenant is summed in the phrase because, therefore. Because I love you without limit. Therefore, I give myself away to you for life or for death. The word contract could be the phrase, if, then. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you do it well, I'll reward you. If you do not do it, then I'll punish you. And that became religion, that God was the judge who gave you the rules, and if you keep them, then I'll accept you. But we're never sure if we do keep them anyway, so it's always an iffy matter. Uh, but if you don't, and we're sure about that, then says this pretend God with a small g, then I will punish you forever and ever. And, and you've got the two. Well, the Pharisees believed the contract God, as the elder brother is, is shown as believing because he said, I've worked for you, then you ought to give me a goat. 
um, no, no sense of relationship. Covenant is relationship. It's love standing in solidarity, binding together. Contract, there's no relationship. You could do a jolly good job of work, but you don't come into the family. Uh, it's contract. And, and, and so that's when, when contract, where I have done it right, and therefore I deserve, and God ought to accept me because I'm better than, when contract hits covenant, tragically, many times a person will prefer their contract than to throw away all their trust in what they've done in order to receive a love you could never earn. And so the truth is, the truth is, I have found in nearly 60 years of ministry, I have found that the hardest people to bring to understanding that God is love are the persons that one would describe as good church people, the religious. They have so much stock in their good works, in their performance, and that they've kept the law and they've pleased everybody around them. And they can look in the mirror and say, I thank you, I'm not as others. In fact, they use others as mirrors to look in, to say, I'm not like them. They find it very difficult to receive a love that is unconditional and a love that has no strings attached and a love that will come and sit with me when I know that I've sinned and, and I am my own worst accuser and to find the arm of God himself around me saying, I love you and I accept you. And um, so I, I, in my heart personally, I cannot believe a person would ever reject this love if they really saw it. And yet we find in the scripture that the more religious one is, the harder it is to accept a love that is only paid for by God himself. We all are raised in this, this awful womb of darkness that is that you are accepted, you're loved, you're rewarded if you perform correctly. And so therefore it's unnatural to, to go along with this satanic lie that God accepts you if you're a good boy, if you're a good girl, if you do everything right, then you're loved. And, and love comes as the reward for performance. I believe that, I, I really believe this, that the very saying of this, this body of truth that I'm seeking to share right now, which the Bible calls gospel, which is a very old English word, it comes from the 16th century. And originally the word gospel meant the good, glad, merry news that makes a man fairly leap for joy. That's out of a 16th century dictionary. Um, and this, is, that's, that's what the Bible calls this body of truth that is that God is love and he came to us in Jesus and Jesus in his death and resurrection joined us in the pit and took us out with him. It's the goodest news you'll ever hear. It's the good, glad, merry news. But also in Romans 1.17, it says this news, the gospel, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And therefore, the very opening of myself, opening of my heart to receive this news, just to receive the, the words that, that God loves me just as I am, that, that he doesn't say he'll love me if I reform my behavior, but he loves me just as I am. That in itself comes to us with the, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to actualize this that comes to us in Jesus. He is the one who actually connects us. And, and number one, I say, to really hear this, by which I mean what I'm saying here is not, and, and I, I don't mean to upset anybody, but this is not 
simply say a sinner's prayer uh, and, and you'll go to heaven when you die. Um, I, I'm speaking of something so radical that in your innermost self, where you can't stand to look at yourself, that, that darkness within that I believe if I ever saw it, I'd die. He comes into that and says, I love you. I love you just as you are. I don't love you because you promised to be better. I don't love you because you're going to grit your teeth and have a better life. I love you just as you are. I love you. To hear that and to know that that is not some word on the ether, but it was actually embodied in Jesus Christ, who is, is God, who took to himself our humanness, came and lived in our world flesh and faced life as we face it, and then embraced us totally, totally as we are, and carried our phony selves into death and, and says, now we're getting out of here. The lamb around his shoulders, that was me, that was you. And he carried us out. And um, now my life, my true self is Christ living in me. Now, that's the good news that comes to us. As, as you hear my words, my words are born on the, the power of the Holy Spirit that is in itself the power of God to change us. But secondly, um, which I believe for everyone, and I include myself on a daily basis, that Paul encourages us. Well, that's a weak word. Um, it's the very core of his message. He prayed that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our understanding and that he would show to us, reveal to us, the hope to which we have been called. And, and that hope includes the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, that takes us out of death and seats us along in the family circle of God. Uh, and it's the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, who would guide us into all truth. It would be the Holy Spirit that would come, take us by the hand, and, and say, this is the way to go. And, and therefore, it's, it's this body of truth, the gospel, but it's also my openness to the Holy Spirit coming to open inside eyes. There, these are not my only eyes. I've got eyes inside. And we use the expression sometimes, I see it. Yes, we do. I, eyes inside open. The Holy Spirit does that. And the Holy Spirit is the one as the guide, he, he puts our footsteps on the path and he leads us in, into the, this, this truth, this actual living of the gospel. And the amazing thing is the behavior takes care of itself. I, I know that for many religious people who think contract, that's impossible. But the fact is, when I see this love in our eyes, see this love, and when the Holy Spirit, who is love, personal energy of love, who comes to actually be my inner strength and the person guiding me from within, I, I will realize there are many things that I would now be doing I don't want to do anymore. Um, and I realize that this is inconsistent with my being the beloved of, of God the Father. And so behavior changes from the inside. It's not now uh, trying to keep an outside contractual law, but it's rather from inside. It's written on our hearts. It's now want-tos. And um, I, I believe that that is what changes us. In fact, it's such a change. This acceptance of the good news and the Holy Spirit opening our eyes it's actually called new birth. And in the Western world in the last half century, the, the expression new birth has taken on almost a, a nothing meaning. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry talks about being born again. But the fact is, it is in the Bible. And, and, and that expression does adequately describe what I'm talking about. The other expression used in Luke 15 is resurrection. It's, it's escape from death into life that can never die. 
a, a new birth into a new creation, call it what you will. Um, all the expressions are extreme, but it, it's, it's an inner seeing of the love of God, an inner responding to let the Holy Spirit work that into me. And I, I said, you know, who is your God? When I realize the true God, then repentance. See, repentance is not moaning over sins I committed in the last 20, 30 years. Repentance, the Greek word means a change of mind. And that means that I change my mind concerning who God is. And that means I've received this good news. The Holy Spirit's opened the eyes of my heart and I'm on a journey in which I'm changing my mind. God is not the judge damning me, condemning me. He's the infinite lover who calls me beloved and says, you are my son, you're my daughter. <laughs>